is it really easier to think like a machine than do some simple math? And of course, by simple here, I'm, I have very specific things in mind, and I'm going to disclose them in, in the minutes to, to follow. So <clears throat> I would say uh, it's a matter of uh, impedance mismatch between uh, the machines that we're supposed to program and we are, as humans, how we, we like to think and, and um, uh, rationalize about things that we're trying to build. And whereas machines are uh, very much about the details, uh, we're much more focused about the ideas that we're trying to deal with. And we have a, a, a global perspective on, on the things that we're trying to achieve. And we're, we're very much goal-oriented in, in what, the, what results we intend to yield from, from the computation that we, we want to um, perform. Uh, whereas we have limited understanding, limited memory of dealing with uh, parts of a system. We generally have difficulty understanding whole systems. And we're, we're trying to do some all sorts of tricks in doing diagrams and components and decomposing problems to, to have local reasoning because we have uh, limited uh, capabilities in understanding large systems and interactions with them. Um, and, and machines uh, have no problem with that. And we are, I was about to say that we are error prone and machines are reliable, but uh, <laughs> I guess that's pretty much out the window. Uh, anyway, my point failed, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, so it's about seeing things differently uh, and, and working in an imperative way versus a declarative way, uh, thinking about how versus uh, what we're trying to achieve. And in, in imperative style, what we've become accustomed to, um, our, our bread and butter is uh, mutation, variable assignment. This is the computational method that we leverage. Uh, whereas for declarative, um, style, we, we usually use logic and rules to activate over some uh, setup that we define. And uh, another way of slicing this would be uh, thinking in terms of imperative versus functional, uh, where the computation method is a function application. And yeah, we're back. So the goal is, uh, in general, I would say minimizing moving parts because of our, of our limited ability to deal with complex systems. Uh, and uh, I like this quote by uh, Michael Feathers, um, object-oriented makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts, whereas functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing the moving parts involved. So <clears throat> what is functional programming? Um, functional programming is a style of programming in which basic method of computation is application of function to arguments. And the functional language is one that supports and encourages a functional style, of course. So uh, are you already using standard optional? Wow, didn't expect so many hands, S super. Uh, and would you like to write exceptionless uh, error handling with standard expected, or are you already using that? Ooh, quite a few fans. I'm so happy about that. Uh, much better than I expected. So I would say if you're already there, uh, you're halfway there to writing in a more functional style. And what you need to, un you need to understand just two functions, I would claim, so that you transform the way you write code in a more functional style, in a more composable style. How are you doing back there? Should I just go on, right? Yeah. Okay. So now we can begin because we, all the technical ses uh, problems have been dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> and now we can begin. So um, if, you, if you blink, uh, in, in sync with uh, the malfunction, then you can barely notice the problem. <laughs> Just try to sync. So a functional language is one that supports and encourages a functional style. And by that, I mean many of these concepts. Uh, and um, no, this is not a talk about Haskell. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we're going to see some. Uh, and 
we're going to see some of these concepts uh, and how they uh, permeate in C++ and how we can leverage them to, to write more uh, expressive and succinct code. And most of the new ideas and innovations in modern programming languages are actually very old. And I tried to maybe distill here uh, a timeline of, of the concepts uh, as they happened, uh, just so you see how you can trace uh, some of these concepts back to, to their origin, original uh, research or incubation languages. So we go quite, quite a few years back. Okay, so um, my claim is that uh, Haskell has, and, and these concepts have, have influenced uh, our uh, programming languages and the way we think about uh, writing and composing programs. I don't know what you're doing, but it's working great. Um, fingers crossed. So uh, indeed, contemporary C++ uh, has become more functional from mundane concepts like lambdas and closures to algebraic data types and, and uh, composable algorithms and, and mapping and high order functions and, and lazy evaluation in ranges and so on. So lots of uh, concepts have um, become uh, part of our, our, our daily routine, our daily coding. So just to give you a quick taste, uh, uh, so, in, in case you don't really know what's going on and the syntax looks weird, uh, so we have two list comprehensions there on, on, on after the WHERE clause. So, uh, we generate two lists, uh, uh, Ys and Zs. Can anyone identify what this is trying to do? And I did this on purpose. Uh, the, there's no meaningful names there. Just shout it out. Ben? It is. <laughs> Very good. And it's even uh, more clear now that uh, I have some better names there. Whereas the two list comprehensions are smaller and larger. So we, we, we do this uh, in a recursive fashion where we apply this uh, function uh, and we obtain a new list by, by decomposing the list in the smaller uh, than the uh, the current evaluated item and larger than currently evaluated item, and we we just recursively do this. And and if you if you are a visual person, then it might be easier to understand how it's uh, going on, like an, in a step by step um, progression, how uh, things are, are are sorted. And by contrast, uh, I, this is just a very I would say simplified pseudocode like uh, version in imperative style. And of course, the devil is in the details there, and uh, it's, I would say it's challenging to produce a solid, robust, uh, equivalent code in an imperative style. And a quick story here. Uh, in uh, 1986, uh, Donald Knuth was asked to implement a program for the programming purse column in uh, communications of ACM. And the task was to read the file of text determined word frequencies, a classic maybe interview problem nowadays, um, and sort them to, to their frequencies. And uh, back then, Pascal was uh, uh, in fashion. Uh, and his solution, very rigorous uh, in Pascal, was about 10 pages long. And anecdotically, uh, as a response, uh, Doug McElroy uh, implemented the same functionality using a six-line shell script. Uh, just by, just com by composing these little bits of uh, functionality and piping together uh, the, the, uh, the, the processing, piping together the, the data. Uh, by the way, who knows who Doug McElroy is? Just... Sorry? <laughs> no, uh, from literature. It's, it's good. So, uh, four hands. So, uh, if you like the pipe, then this is the person to, to, to think about. Um, a link to um, his Wikipedia page there. So it's all about pipes. And uh, I would uh, encourage you in taking inspiration from uh, Doug McElroy's uh, Unix shell script to try to achieve the same goal 
in, in, in the same spirit in any programming language that you're comfortable with, uh, maybe C++. Uh, so you might say that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked on, on this uh, fancy new way of uh, composing programs uh, and I, I wanna start learning more about this. Uh, and I mentioned math and I, uh, there, there was a link there to a presentation by Bartosz Milewski. Uh, this is his book, it's uh, freely available online um, if, you, if you wanna read it. It's a very good book, but not very C++. If you don't like Haskell, it's gonna feel uh, harder to progress through it. Um, so if, if you wanna apply these concepts in, in something more, in more, in more practical fashion and in, in the programming language that you're comfortable with, I would recommend that you start with this book which is much more accessible, uh, Functional Programming in C++, by my friend Ivan. Very, very good and very applied examples are very easy to progress through and they don't feel alien or too mathematical in nature, in presentation. So I promised um, that you only need to understand two functions um, to write C++ in a, in a more functional style. And, uh, we're gonna start by uh, uh, looking at um, two fundamental concepts that are needed to uh, get, a, under, get an understanding of how these functions uh, are supposed to work. And uh, we have to start with uh, the first concept is, and that is uh, lifting and uh, talking about higher order functions. Who, th who here has written higher order functions or has used higher order functions? So if, if not all hands are up and they're not, then means, it means that uh, people are not aware they're using higher order functions because most, uh, most certainly you're using them. For example, if you're using the standard library, your uh, algorithms, you're using higher order functions. Um, uh, some uh, examples of um, dedicated libraries for uh, working and composing and, and building such functions are boost uh, uh, H or F. Uh, or, I'm gonna embarrass my friend Bjorn here, <laughs> who's in the room and uh, is the author of this one. And the reason why I'm, uh, I keep mentioning it and um, uh, every time I do this, uh, he says he has a surge in, in, in the GitHub pull request <laughs> and issues open. So I'm gonna <laughs> give him some more work. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because uh, it's instructive. Um, so even if you're not intent of, on using this library uh, in your code, in, in, in your projects per se, I would say it's very instructive to look at it, look at the source code. And I'm gonna explain some, uh, just a, a few concepts. So some examples of higher order functions, I, I'm sure you've seen and you recognize these names in, in any form, uh, in any place. Um, let's start with a very trivial um, expositional um, example. Let's say we have a, a structure, a simple structure and some projections into that structure. Let's say we, we can, uh, select the name and a number or an ID or something. And we want to sort by one of these projections. We want to sort by name or by number. We want to find some, some record or something like that. Uh, using such facilities, like uh, in this case, lift compose or similar functionality from another library, uh, uh, whichever you prefer, uh, you can provide the the, the, the two selectors, the two functions, uh, select name and select number, you can provide them as arguments to this compose function, which has a very purpose, purposely uh, explicit name of I'm composing, I'm, I'm taking a function as argument and I'm, I'm composing some functions here. So uh, this is a way of creating a, an, a, an adapter, creating a new function out of the, the two projections that we have in the, uh, for that structure and use them with the standard algorithms that you see on the slide. And if you're already using C++20 ranges, um, you're, you're seeing patterns like this all the time and even more complex ones, of course. Um, worth mentioning here, 
Um, by the way, uh, don't pay attention to those um, horrible preprocessor tricks. Um, by the way, I, I saw Andre contributed the, uh, <laughs> another variant of doing this. Um, but I, I prefer this one, to be honest. Um, and uh, the, the reason I'm mentioning this, and ignore the macro details because they're not pretty, uh, is uh, one important aspect that we need to deal with sometimes is uh, overload sets. And if we're thinking about uh, functions like toString or any other um, overload sets that might be useful, whenever we need to do uh, function composition, overload sets might um, um, provide challenges. And a technique such as this one will help pick up the right uh, overload uh, in this case for toString uh, to be used for uh, this transformation we're doing here. Uh, by the way, there's a, there's a more detailed paper that I linked here about lifting overload sets into objects. It's a fairly old proposal, I think maybe five years old, uh, that didn't make it into the standard, but it's a, an instructive paper to look at uh, if you want to learn more about these kinds of things. And by the way, I'm, I'm, uh, all my slides are sprinkled with links and links to videos and articles and stuff. And, uh, uh, you can take pictures now, or you, when you get the slides, you can uh, browse at your own leisure any segues and, and uh, references that I have in the slides. Uh, and this is, if, if you want just to um, drill down in, on uh, harder functions and, and learn more about these kinds of patterns and how you can write your own, and how you can compose them uh, elegantly, uh, this is the presentation that I would recommend. Um, Okay, and now we have to talk about the, the other side of things, uh, which is the most important one, and that would be boxes. And there are various types of boxes that we already know. Um, just a few examples here. Um, you, um, I'm gonna pick uh, on optional and focus on that, but the same kinds of concepts apply to, to any kind of box that we use to uh, encapsulate the value within. And we might have like single value boxes like optional or multiple value boxes like vector and so on. Uh, and there's various ways of accessing uh, the value within uh, such a box. Some examples there. I'm sure they're familiar. So now, now is the moment where uh, it's gonna be tough uh, explaining some of these concepts without, uh, I don't know, maybe using some fancy words. Uh, but I, I'm going to try not to do that. And I think the best way uh, to help people who are not familiar with these concepts uh, understand them is to point them, not at me, but at this uh, reference. And that is the, um, I think, a series of three articles, if I remember correctly, by Aditya Burgava. Um, the link is there. And the reason why I uh, always like to point people to this resource uh, for learning about the concepts uh, such as uh, functor, uh, map, applicative, monads, and so on, uh, is that uh, they're explained not in a mathematical fashion using category theory and fancy uh, mathematical uh, structures. Uh, they, they use nice uh, diagrams and very simple to grasp examples. So uh, I do encourage you to follow along. Um, so, and I'm going to try just to distill the, the very essence of what's required so that we progress. And that I would say that when dealing with values that might be there or might not be there, uh, we have to deal, them, deal with them in their context. So we must uh, uh, refrain of trying to reach for those values as we try to push uh, th th those values through a computational pipeline. So the idea is to try to think and deal with them in their context and move the, 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 the modified, the, the, the new values, the processed values through the computational pipeline, move them in their context. That's what I mean by, by box. I mean their value with its context. If we have a value, we might not have a value all the time. So, uh, Whenever we think about, uh, for example, applying a function that does a transformation, uh, this is a, a process that, that behind the scenes 
extracts a value if it's there, applies the function, and then rewraps it in, in that context and passes it along. So that's the whole idea of uh, hiding this uh, reaching into the box and, and seeing the value. So it's, a, it's an illusion of, of moving the computation along. Um, so going back to uh, one such example that we cared about, standard optional, standard optional can sim greatly simplify the code if we're using it appropriately. And I've seen many situations where it's used weirdly uh, and it, it complicates things rather than helping in any way. So um, when using standard optional, don't try to look inside the box, don't try to unwrap, uh, don't try to use standard optional for error handling. It's not great for that, there are alternatives. It can be used for that, but it's not great. Um, and when in doubt, I would say draw some inspiration from other programming languages, other libraries that have been doing this for years, and I, I'm gonna give some examples. Uh, so uh, some examples we're gonna see are from uh, Rust and others from uh, Haskell. So whenever we have uh, a chain of functions, uh, boringly named here F, H, uh, and G, uh, try to avoid branching on whether we have a value or not whenever we call uh, a function that is supposed to take as input the, the return of the other one and so on. Try to not do control flow based on uh, the condition of whether or not we have a null opt in that box. And the way we do that is using concepts like fmap, where we, 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 we apply the, the, the function, we apply the, the transformation we want uh, in a transparent fashion without needing to check at edge, uh, every stage whether uh, we have that value in hand or not. Let's see some examples, rather than me waving my hands. Uh, let's say we have a, a plain function capitalized that takes a standard string and returns a standard string and does the obvious uh, naming thing. Uh, and we uh, might get a, a, a string from an operation that could fail, let's say. And that's why we're capturing this uh, stir as an optional string. So. And we want to capitalize this result that we get from some other place. And of course, we can check if string, then apply the capitalized function uh, on the value of that string, because we checked it's there in the box. Uh, we can go f a bit further and say, OK, because the original string might not be there, then its capitalized version might not be there. So we need to keep wrapping the result in an optional string. But then again, we're doing this check, uh, the very thing that I uh, advised against. So uh, what I propose is thinking in terms of lifting. And now I'm going back to, to lift and how are the functions. And thinking about uh, lifting the operation, lifting the capitalized operation uh, to operate uh, on optional of string and produce an optional of string. So, it's the same thing, but we wrapped this check uh, behind this operation. And you might say, okay, hold on, but uh, are we doing the same thing, but inside the function? That's the whole point. And uh, the idea is that we can do this in a general fashion. So we don't have to lift every function that we write. Uh, but uh, let's start here. So we, what we're doing basically is changing the domain and codomain of this function. So instead of going from string to string, it's going from optional of string to optional of string. So going from box to box. So that's the lifted function. So in a generalized fashion, uh, we might say it's going from, instead from A to B to optional of A to optional of B. That's the lifted function. One possible implementation Let's call it fmap, uh, not by accident. Uh, and we can see it takes, by the way, this is one higher order function. It takes another function as argument. Uh, and it takes a function uh, from A to B, as you can see from the signature, and an optional A, and returns an optional B. And it does this 
checking the box inside, so it masks its operation. Um, if you don't like that kind of implementation, here's another one. Uh, does the same thing, uh, this time around without using standard function. So again, same concept. Lifts the original function f so that it now works from option of a to option of b in a general fashion. So it's no longer about capitalized, it's no longer about strings. Still about optionals because I'm, it's easier to just show an example with optional. Question? Did you pretend that the second sentence of optional was correct? Should the return time be decal type of optional of? Yes, yes, good point. <laughs> I have to remember to update this. Good point. Um, similar thing, uh, let's say we want to do um, an, an F map on a, on a standard vector. Again, to achieve this, uh, I'm cheating here. I'm, doing, I'm using the standard transform, which is another higher order function. And by the way, F map transform, not coincidence that there, I implemented one in terms of the other for this vector. Uh, and uh, we can another think of another such example where we might um, want to gather a, a vector of lengths for some strings. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one way of composing. I, I, I give it, it's not pretty. Uh, it's one of, way of composing uh, this operation uh, of applying length uh, to these strings. So if you want to visualize this, um, let's say now we have a two-stage thing. Uh, so um, we have some strings that we want to trim first, and then we want to compute the, the, their lengths. So uh, we, we want to chain these operations. So um, on the lower, uh, uh, we have um, trim, which goes from string to string like we're used to, and length, which goes to, from string to int. And the lifted functions are lifted trim and lifted length, which are all operate in terms of their boxes. And we might compose them like that. Um, another example, a uh, bit more practical, I would say, uh, inspired from reality. Uh, let's say we want to um, get some debug, source debug location for, for some program counter or something like that. And uh, we load the symbols uh, for that uh, uh, location and to, to get the file and length, uh, line number and so on. So again, we have uh, some operations that could fail and we were interested in, in doing some computation and, and chaining these operations together. So uh, we might uh, compose the load symbol operation and the string representation, the two string uh, of that result uh, by, by stacking together two such uh, mapping, two such uh, mapping operations. Or we can maybe think about some syntactic sugar on that, uh, either pipes or uh, continuations with dot and so on, what, what, whatever is your preferred way of doing it. That's not important. So, before we move on to more uh, uh, complicated examples here with optional, uh, let's re regroup our, ourselves a bit and see what we covered. We discussed about type constructors, uh, and I, I want to give some terminology here because you're probably going to see it and um, maybe needs to sound familiar. So boxes that wraps another type, encapsulates the value in its context, uh, function lifting, higher order functions, um, lifting the domain and codomain of, of a function, um, and how we can do composition by chaining such operations together. And now that we dealt with the toy example, let's see, maybe look at something more grounded in, in reality. Uh, and uh, now I have to talk about um, extensions to standard optional. You might have heard about them as named as monadic extensions. Um, so let's say we have a, a string view to int function that does some 
um, parsing uh, from, from something that is represented as a string and might yield an integer or not. Don't mind about the grayed out stuff, uh, not important what, what the function is doing. The important bit is that it might fail in, in some fashion, might fail to parse that buffer as, a, as an integer. So if we're thinking about, okay, we wanna parse that uh, buffer as an integer and do something with it. Don't know what exactly what. Um, so we're, we're using this continuation pattern where we're saying, okay, we're parsing this buffer as an integer, and then we wanna do something with this integer. In this example, I'm clamping the value or something. I think it's some sort of logger. Uh, and then I wanna do some transformation to, to change this value, do some processing on it, uh, maybe change its type, uh, and handle uh, any situations where uh, this might fail. And only at the end of this computation chain I want to pick at the value if I have one. So you might notice there that at the very end, and you kind of have to read this vertically, so that's why I'm aligning them in, in this way, whether you like it or not. Uh, so it kind of looks like a sequential uh, uh, ordering of things, and it is. Uh, and if you look at it, you see that the place where we actually peek at the value to see if it's there or not, it's at the very end of this processing pipeline. So it's, that's what I'm saying when I say don't peek uh, in intermediate stages of the computation. So a, a bit of, of heritage here, and I have to, I, I told you earlier that when in doubt, look at what others do. Uh, Rust has been doing this for way longer than uh, we, in C++, so uh, it, it, in Rust, the optional is called option, and it's defined as an enumeration, which, by the way, it's a much more powerful, powerful concept in, in Rust. Uh, enumerations have, can have associated types, and um, you can pattern match them, and uh, you can view them as type constructors, so they're more fancy in, in that way. Um, I'm not gonna go in details, uh, but the idea is uh, we have a, a list there, and we're trying to get some element and the canonic, canonical standard library function that gets that value by position will have to return an optional because that position might not have a value. So it's encoded in the, in the API signature that it returns an option of T. And uh, it has, as you can see in the definition above, it has two type constructors. You can have some T or no T. So I think it's, fairly self-explanatory by, by the naming. So in the first example, we have some Rust, which is the result of that computation. Uh, whereas in the, the second example, um, the, the, the result is none, because we don't have anything on that position. Uh, similar thing in, in Haskell, even way before Rust. Uh, the type is called maybe, by the way. If you like the scary fancy name, this is also Monad. Uh, so uh, maybe has, again, two type constructors, just, which is the when we have a value and nothing when we ha don't have one. And again, a pattern matching uh, example here, when we have a value and when we don't. Don't worry about the syntax. Uh, I'm just trying to show you that the, the same concepts are there. So by the way, in, in talking about naming, uh, and the fact that you're gonna see these uh, in, in literature, in examples, blogs, and so on, books. So uh, I said that these are the two functions I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation when the screen was flickering. Uh, so uh, transform is actually a functor. Uh, by the way, uh, some people mistake this with function objects. They're, there's nothing uh, uh, related. So uh, transform is a functor and uh, in, in Haskell, the equivalent is an F map, and on, uh, in other programming languages, it's called a map or an F map. Uh, and, and then is a monad, uh, and um, in, in some programming languages, it's called a bind operation. And this is the one that we're chaining together. So again, going back to uh, pretty pictures, visualizations of these concepts. So a bind unwraps the value and feeds forcibly fills this 
uh, unwrapped value into a function, uh, and then uh, it wraps uh, the result out. Uh, so, and of course, if you put in nothing, you get in no, get out nothing. So that again applies. Uh, the power comes from chaining this. So uh, it's, this, this concept is not useful on its own. So only when you have to build up chains and compose these operations, multiple such operations together, this is where bind operation uh, actually shows its power and, and, and the fact that you can easily chain these operations together without dealing with uh, what happens uh, uh, from, from one uh, operation to another. So I have one more example here uh, with more, um, more stages than before. So let's say I have a create widget function that might fail to create a widget, maybe something, you know, some windowing control or something like that. Uh, and we have the or else, which is the failure case. Uh, and um, I don't know, in these situations, I chose to log the failure, uh, nothing fancier. Uh, and notice here that uh, the callable lambda returns an optional widget here. And the same thing applies to the create widget function. So create widget function returns an optional widget. Might fail from, for some reason or, not, or another. So or else means I fail to create the widget. And then if I manage to create the widget, I'm going to call the add styles function, maybe add some window styles or something similar. Uh, this operation again takes a, an optional widget and returns an optional widget by modifying its styles, internal styles. This operation, let's say, might fail for some other reason. Uh, so that's why I have the or else. And then after I successfully added the styles, I want to add some frame and so on, add some rendering region and, and so on and so on. So multiple operations stacked together. And at the very end, I want to get the I don't know, maybe a render surface or render target for, for that widget. And I'm doing the transform uh, after the, the widget has properly been constructed out of all these in, in initialization steps that all might fail in some fashion or another. And each, or, each one of those functions, like add frame, for example, I, I told you, takes an optional and returns an optional. Question here? The first. Only. Yeah. The, from the or else. The first or else. Yeah. So the, the other or else is just the first. Yes. Uh, so, um, OK. So add frame and add region and add styles, they all look the same way. They take an option and return an option. Uh, get render, which was passed to the, to the transform function, uh, again, takes us an optional widget and returns an optional render surface in this case. That's why it's a transform, because now it returns a different type. Uh, so the render, it's supposed to re return a render surface it, if it got a valid widget. If it didn't get a valid widget, then it's supposed to return a null opt instead of the render surface. Uh, where you need to be careful here is that uh, when applying transform, transform actually wraps the result in an optional. Transform from optional, not standard transform, by the way. So uh, optional transform wraps the result in a standard optional. So uh, if the callable pass to transform returns an optional t, then the result of the transform, in this case our p variable, will be an optional of optional of t. And you need to be aware of this situation. And I, I've gotten questions related to to, to these nested optionals uh, before. So be aware when, and sometimes it's surprising for folks when you get a an, an nested optional or maybe more. So uh, nested optionals, depending on how you structure your computation, nested optionals can happen. And then I see people sprinkling their code with value dot value dot value dot value. Dot <laughs> because, uh, OK, they kind of know they did their checks that everything is in line. And then they're just, just going to unwrap that value. <laughs> and when I see code like that, it just makes me sad. 
so I don't know if uh, any of you saw this movie, uh, and I can't believe it's 23 years old. Dude, where's my car? Have you seen it? Yeah, there's a there's a very funny, annoying scene with uh, them ordering uh, some Chinese food, and the, the the speaker box keeps telling them, and then and then. This is how I feel about this. Uh, so, uh, flattening. So whenever we have these nested optionals, we have to think about f how we, we're doing flattening. So uh, when we combine uh, two different empty states of, uh, of optionals into just one, that's w when we say we're flattening this. And from two, optional, two nested optionals, we get just one optional. Uh, so uh, flattening optionals loses information. And we need to be aware of that. And depending on how many levels and when the optional uh, uh, was occurred during the computation chain, it, it might be for different reasons. Uh, so if we're squishing two distinct empty states into one, this is when we, we get into trouble because we don't know which came from what computation. So uh, without context, two empty states are indistinguishable with, uh, from each other. So remember when I said it's important to keep the computation with the box, with its context? So if you have two empty states, you don't know which one came uh, and for what reason. Why, would, why was it empty? Was it empty at stage two of the pipeline or at stage three? Uh, did I fail adding styles? Did I fail adding the render target? What stage failed? So. Uh, an empty optional state has inherently has no meaning because it, it doesn't carry the information of fail to create the widget, fail to add the frame, and so on. So I would say in, in, if you're encoding the operation in terms of optionals, in most situations, it might probably be OK to collapse nested optionals because you don't have that context information for the failure anyway. So you don't know why it failed. So I'm, and by you, I mean the caller at the end of the computation. Intermediate stages know what happened, and they can, the, the, they can query, and can, they can log, they can do whatever. But at the end, uh, the, the caller has no context. The optional type has no way of carrying this context. So I would say in most situations, it's OK to collapse. Uh, but you have to think, is standard optional, if this uh, nested optional collapsing worries you that you lost the information, you don't know where the failure occurred, then maybe optional wasn't the right type to encode that operation. So that's why uh, there's a, an alternative to, to carry this context, to carry extra information about what happened. So that's why we get uh, standard expected, which has the additional E type, which is E for error, and can be anything. Uh, and we can carry this uh, information along. And whenever we compose in terms of expected, and by the way, it works in very much the same way uh, as optional, in terms of the same continuation, same kind of structure, uh, and, and bind operations uh, when chaining multiple such uh, things. Uh, the only thing that we need to be careful there is that we need to match the error types. So we either have a single error type that we propagate through a com computation chain, or if we have multiple error types, they need to match up together, because otherwise it, it, it won't compile. Uh, so, but we can carry this extra information. Uh, and I have a very simple example here, very similar to the previous one, where I chose to implement a parse error type, and I carry this, uh, and I chose a very uh, trivial th thing here, where I, my parse error type just has some reason string for the failure. Uh, and I, I, uh, I propagate this error type, uh, by the way, using the convenience standard unexpected function, which constructs this type that I, I want. So, uh, and now I can carry this information and I can see if I have an out of range error or not an integer error or whatever, uh, overflow and so on. So I can encode the, this extra information. Uh, No, uh, because it's past. Uh, so it only gets the error value, but it doesn't know what the value value is. It doesn't know. I, I don't think it has to. I don't think it has to. 
I believe it's correct. Because it doesn't, it, it, when it's constructed this way, it's constructed with the now the, the error type. So it's like a, think of it like a variant. So. Yeah, but Can you say that louder? Exactly. Yes. Yes. That, yeah, that's, I, I think, I thought that was what I was saying. <laughs> anyway. uh, so I believe this code is correct, uh, but you can try it on. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm a bit short on time because of the technical stuff, but I'm, I'm gonna take questions at the end. So uh, a very similar thing uh, we, we have in, in Rust. Uh, I, I, in Rust, there's a, a, a result type that, uh, again, it's an enumeration with two type constructors with associated types T and E, and it has the okay value and the error uh, situation. And again, I'm encoding the a trivial operation here, and my my error type is division by zero. Uh, very a trivial thing here. Uh, same concept. And by the way, uh, for those who are interested in this, Rust actually does some uh, flattening for result types. If the the the, the uh, error types, the associated error types match, it does flattening. So by the way, be aware of that. And it also has some convenience things because it's such a prevalent result type in Rust is such a prevalent in API design and in, in, in standard library and everything that people build as well. Uh, and it, it also has syntactic sugar for bubbling up these things uh, with the question mark. So if you if you're interested in these things, they being such so prevalent, they they actually have some syntactic sugar to avoid boilerplate in functions so that when you just want to bubble up the result from a function to a function to a function, if, the, if they're using the same result E type, error type, then it's just trivial to just bubble up um, the error context up to the caller. How many uh, errors, uh, level errors up? Uh, same thing in, in Haskell, many, many years before Rust. Uh, it's called the either type, and it has a left and right. Uh, it doesn't matter which uh, you encode as the right thing or the error thing, uh, which is on the left, which is on the right. Um, so, uh, again, same concept. Uh, I, in, the, in this situation, I'm choosing uh, left as the error type here. Um, same concept. So, a um, bit about availability, because I always get this question. So, uh, for optional, I saw a lot of hands when I asked. So. Uh, oh, the, those were the versions available. For standard expected, this is by C++23, just in case you weren't aware. Uh, and these are the main compiler tool chains and the versions when, it's, when they started supporting this in the standard library. For the uh, continuation functions, the end then, and the family of uh, monadic continuations, for standard optional, uh, these are the, on the left side, these are the versions when they implemented that. And standard expected is already uh, built in with all the functionality from the start. And those are the um, versions when they built. Uh, Clank 17 was the last one to add this up. And now we can say that all major tool chains finally had, have this. Last time I gave this talk, Clank didn't have it. Uh, <clears throat> if you're not there, because you might want to use this and your project, your team might not be on the latest C++ version or access to the latest uh, standard library and compiler toolchain. There are alternatives and I would say their uh, production quality, they're very, very good. They've been used uh, by many projects. Um, do try them out. Uh, maybe play with them, get a feel for, for how it is to program in, 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 su in such a fashion. Uh, if you gain confidence and buy in from your team and uh, teammates, uh, you can even start using them in your in your projects, and these implementations are C plus plus seventeen equivalent uh, or lower. Uh, I do recommend this article by my colleague Sai Brand uh, if you want to read more about using uh, the continuations uh, patterns. Uh, 
I have uh, one more uh, angle here about um, when dealing with computation and, and chaining computation in such a way, it's very important to think in terms of values. And we always have to remember that expressions yield values, whereas statements do not. Uh, and I'm going to embarrass another friend in the room. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, highly recommend that you watch um, this presentation by uh, Ben Dean uh, from a few years back now. Uh, I keep recommending it. Uh, easy to use, hard to misuse, declarative style in C++. Um, link is in the slide uh, button, right? It's all about uh, using different means of thinking uh, about uh, uh, computation and, and, and designing programs uh, in, in a declarative style. And I like this table very much because I think it uh, expresses uh, things very tersely. Uh, another presentation that I uh, highly encourage people to see about uh, values, regular types. I gave a, a few presentations a few years back about regular types. I really care about the, these ideas. Uh, I very much enjoyed this presentation by Dave Abrahams about value semantics from last year. Uh, it's all about whole uh, object, whole part semantics and value types and decoupling uh, object relationships and thinking about uh, values. Um, another one, highly recommended, value semantics, uh, the most valuable values by Juan Bolivar Puente. Um, and uh, if you uh, want to think in terms of being practical and retrofitting some of these concepts in, in existing projects, because few of us have the luxury of starting things uh, new, uh, and we kind of have to bring these concepts in existing code bases, which might be written in to totally different fashion, uh, this is a good uh, g gateway presentation to figuring out how to uh, retrofit and reconcile these worlds and progressively adopt things in, a, in an imperative um, code base. So adopting uh, such concepts. Squaring the circle is the, is the talk. There are multiple versions of it available. Very good. Uh, so I had a, a section on, a short section on ranges, and but I'm going to just skip to one important bit. And embarrass two more friends in the room. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, uh, a pitch to, to see two talks here. Uh, and uh, I have a, this was part of a ranges section where I had code on the left written in an imperative style and code on the right written in, a, uh, in, a, in ranges, in, in functional compositional style. So I had multiple such examples like this one. But I want to skip to this, this one, which I find uh, very juicy. Uh, and it's called uh, Sushi for Two, the slide. Uh, and this is where uh, Connor Hookstra, who's right there at the back, uh, uh, did, uh, did, did solve this uh, problem. It's not a complicated problem, but it's a very instructive one. Solved it in a very imperative style. So you can see that on the left. Not even sure it's correct. He claims it is, but I'm going to trust him. Uh, now, I can't follow that, really. I need tests, I need a debugger to verify that kind of thing. <laughs> so, but I trust him. Uh, so that's uh, very much in an imperative style, whereas uh, the one on the right, uh, using uh, his fancy com uh, combinators, uh, helper library, and, and uh, ranges, um, I would say it's considerably simpler. Uh, but it requires that you're familiar with the concepts. So again, uh, I'm not going to claim that, oh, it's obvious what the right-hand side does. And No, if you're educated and you're familiar with the concepts and you've played around with them and you, you get comfortable writing in such a style, then um, I would say um, it, it's, it's a, the preferred method. Uh, very much in the same fashion as um, uh, that's a rotate from Shine Parent, right? Using algorithms uh, is much more expressive. And an alternative uh, thing um, is from uh, Tristan, who is also in the room. They're uh, using a different library. So by the way, uh, both 
these people are here and they have talks. So I, <laughs> I highly recommend that you go uh, see these talks if you haven't already. So uh, Tristan has uh, a different library, uh, it's called Flux, that uh, is trying to do the same kinds of things, but taking a very different approach from uh, the standard ranges. So I highly recommend that you see uh, Iteration Revisited and um, maybe play around with uh, his library. It's on GitHub. So I, because I'm uh, exactly on time, but I skipped some bits, sorry about that, technical problems. Um, when I did the historical segue for evolution of uh, these programming concepts, uh, Phil Wadler was uh, one of the important figures there. And I'm gonna end the presentation on uh, this quote from uh, Phil Wadler. See what functional programming does to you. Uh, so make your code readable. Uh, pretend the next person who looks at your code is a psychopath and they know where you live. And this is what uh, I'm trying to achieve here is uh, I'm not trying to convince people to mm, write functional programming. I'm not trying to convert people to Haskell or Rust. I'm trying to convince people to write more readable code, code that is more fluent in nature, uh, more terse, more easy to understand, to decompose, to test. Um, so that's, that's the goal. And these are just some mechanisms to achieve that goal. So thank you.